Hello, everyone, and welcome to another WIF Electronic ISOs webinar. My name is Markus Ebele, and I will moderate this webinar today. We are very pleased that you took the time to participate in our webinar. The topic of today's practice oriented webinar is EMC problems on PCB level. Our speaker today is Goran Völke, who is working as global business consultant at WIF Electronic ISOs. He will hold today's webinar and also answer your questions. Before we start the webinar, I would like to point out one thing. You will be muted during the webinar today. This means that you cannot ask us questions via microphone during the webinar. Nevertheless, you have the opportunity to ask us questions during the webinar at any time via the chat function. You will find the chat function in the webinar control panel. Today's webinar will be about 30 minutes long. The chat questions will then be answered in a question answer session following the webinar. The other attendees cannot see your question and we will um, just um, read the question. There are also 10 to 15 minutes in addition scheduled for this. If we are unable to answer all your questions within this time, we will answer them via email after the webinar. If you still have any other questions left after the webinar, just email us at isis-webinar at we-online.com. We will try to answer all questions promptly. At the end of the webinar, you will be asked to participate in a feedback survey. We would be pleased if you take the time to fill out the survey and help us to improve our webinars. You will also receive the link to the presentation as well as to the recording of the webinar only in the next few weeks. And now I will hand over to our speaker, Lorand, and I wish you an exciting webinar. Thank you, Marcus. I just have to close my webcam because now you see me. And because of the bandwidth, I guess we can spare some bandwidth. You know, I'm here. Hello. All right. So my name is Laurent Völker. I'm a field application engineer here at Word Electronic, working over 20 years already at Word. And um, before I was a uh, design engineer for explosion safety remote controls. Today, I want to talk about some EMC issues on PCB level. But uh, the thing is, before we start, I will just remember some little issues for EMC requirements because when you're placing any device to the European market, you have to comply with several different laws. There are 20 regulations and directives. One of those is the low voltage directive. Another one is the EMC compatibility. The other one is the radio equipment device, RDD. The thing is that if you are using a device which has uh, RF module, communication module or something like that, or remote control, um, you have to comply with the RED, and RED is including already EMC. So you don't have to make additional EMC and RED or LVD. So if you have a battery operated radio equipment device, you will have all these three already in RED included. That's the new goal since 2014. You have to take care when you make your declarations, you should not use the old declaration 2008, which is not more valid. Uh, depends now if you are going to different country out of Europe, like in US, you have to comply with the FCC. FCC in comparison with the CE, uh, it is different because um, FCC doesn't need uh, immunity test. You are just measured for uh, emission and uh, they don't care for uh, immunity. They say it's a quality issue if your device is crap and doesn't work. It's a quality issue. So you have to make your device that it's still working in also some rush environment. Um, Japan has the FCCI, Australia, CTIC, China, CCC. You will see that every civilized country, you will find a EMC regulation. It's very important economical point of view when you start to design EMC conform because that could be kind of not so convenient if you are um, design your device, you go into mass production and with your first uh, 
device you go to the EMC lab and they say guys this is not correct you are, are violating the regulation you are not on limits and you have to redesign it but now you want to start mass production and sell the product and that's quite late and now you start to put some ferrites on the cable sometimes helps sometimes not you put some expensive shielding metal shielding into the into the box or something additional which have to be hand manipulated that's not the aim of the emc law i say always emc design it's starting very early in development phase when you make your schematic and you're designing like a power supply with one megahertz switching frequency then you have to think about do i need to put here some filter to be safe that I don't have some harmonics. And if you filter the, for the switching fragments, the third, fifth, and seventh harmonics, you may have no problem in the EMC if you do everything almost in the right way. If you think this is not your problem, this is an EMC guy problem, you already you lose this fight because it will be paid back, I promise. It's very interesting that if you are reaching already the prototype stage and you have implement all your uh, experience of EMC and you have put a, even if it's just a simple LC filter and in the beginning you put no capacitor and instead of L you put just a simple zero ohm pad resistor and you go to the EMC chamber and they say, mm -mm, this is not good, you have to do something, then you just take a soldering iron, this solder the zero ohm resistor, put a ferrite bit, put a small capacity according the frequency which you want to filter and you pass the MC test. Can you imagine how good feel that, that you don't need to redesign your device? So I highly recommend to do that in early stage, at least before your prototyping and not when you want to start mass production. How you can check the EMC? This question has been asked many, many times from people and the answer is not that simple. I will say even your a good radio amateur and you have some radio equipment, you should need to be a EMC compliant uh, an echoic chamber. You need a really EMI receiver, some antennas. And with this one, you can make a really good measurement, which will be not failed in the EMC test. Or you have your own EMC laboratory. That's of course, this is much better, but the investment is not so small. You have to invest at least 500,000 euro for that kind of EMC lab. And even you have the investment and you have the equipment and everything. Do you know how to handle it? Do you know how to measure in the correct way? Normally you will need several years of experience in the EMC lab to be able to make a repetitive uh, measurement and to have the same results. I just want to remember that Sometimes you just forget the analog technology and um, it's very important that if you want to connect a source impedance which is low with a high impedance which, with a load impedance which is high, you have to apply different filter topologies. Like if you have low and high, you have to put the LC filter. If both sides are very high, a capacity will work. But if is both sides very low or maybe you don't know how low it is, if you just put capacity, it won't work. You have to check different filter topologies. I always start with the LC filter, and if the LC filter doesn't give the right results, I give him a second C, so I've made from LC a P filter. If the P filter not giving the right attenuation, I say, maybe I'm wrong in the impedance, and I go back to my LC and try another L additional, so I have my T filter. One of those filters were acting perfectly or very good for differential mode noise. Please use for capacity small values between one nanofarad to maximum one microfarad. For the inductor, it is recommended to use inductors which have low Q factor. A high Q factor inductance used in the filter is not that good because the filter can start to ring. We say the filter is ringing with the noise. You will see this uh, effect when you put a, a filter and the number of peaks will be double or even the in amplitude it's increasing. That means that the filter is not the right way 
because it's ringing if you have the too high Q factor of the inductance. And a special pay attention to of the surfaces and fragments of the used components. You don't want to build additional oscillators. Now, who's responsible for all this noise? Who's making that kind of noise? Well, one of the most well-known noise source are mostly the power supply. In a power supply, like in this example of buck converter, it's quite very aggressive on the input. It's dirty because you don't take the current continuously, you switch on and switch off and charge and discharge this coil and capacity. Actually, in the buck converter, you transfer the energy which you are storing in the input capacity through a coil to the output capacity. And if you pay attention and you remember what is the the name of this in capacity, which is an input and output through a coil, you realize very fast, oh my God, this is my dipole antenna. So please pay attention and take care about this track between input capacity and the output capacity. If you go with a near field sound and you put this to a, to a spectrum analyzer and you approach this track here, you will see this is the mostly dangerous and really um, noisy area. Because of this, please keep this track short as possible, low impedance and possible, and the best way, never push the auto routing button. I would rename this button in the PCB uh, uh, layer uh, software. I would put this button a new name, like make EMC problem button. Because if you route that in different layers, oh my God. Yes, you will need a lot of patience to reroute it and to remake your PCB many times. Don't push the auto routing button. Well, we have here always in the EMC, like a, in the back converter, this kind of noise loops. The biggest noise loop you can see here, it's on the input because you have the input capacity, controller, MOSFETs. The, it's a synchronous buck, so you emulate the diode here with this switch. And then this is the bigger and higher area of DT after DI, you know, D, DI after DT, that's right. And uh, you will have here the very, very big noisy area. And the small area, which is not so potential for EMI noise, is the output, because you also discharge and, and charge capacity and inductor, but this noise is not that much. You have some rest ripple noise, but actually um, buck converter is very noisy on input and not that noisy on output. Anyhow, it is good to make that in that way that if you put your feedback, you keep the feedback outside of this noisy loop because the feedback response of your controller, it's a very sensitive input. You are measuring here milli and microvolts, and because of this reason, it's recommended to have this feedback to not generate our own EMC problem out of this noisy area. Not noisy in the input and not noisy in the output area. Try to track that outside to have a good feedback response. Additional, you have uh, the noise loop on the input because your capacity on input is not an ideal capacity. It has a parasitic ASL, has a parasitic ESR, and the input line is also not the ideal one. He has also parasitic uh, inductance. The source has a parasitic capacitance as well. So in this area, we will generate the major conducted emission noise by a buck converter. The output noise, because you can keep this track short, you can keep that very short normally. You have not that high output noise, but on the input, you will definitely have always a higher input. If it's a boost converter, then mostly you should not focus on input filtering. You should focus on output filtering. Boost converter, they are most dirty in terms of EMI on the output. If you know now the replacement parasitics of your input capacity, like your ESR value, ESL value, which is mostly given from the capacity manufacturing a data sheet. And you know also the parasitics of your input lines. And if you count like one millimeter PCB track is one nanofarad inductor parasitics. And if you take all this in consideration, you may even be able to calculate the expected noise on the input or in terms of EMI. 
Additional, when you look with your scope on your, on your rectangle signal, you will see that this rectangle signal is not correctly rectangled. You have an overshot and some ringing. And this ringing generate that even if you use a 500 kilohertz switching frequency, and you will see some noise at several hundreds of megahertz, it is because of the high frequency area here, you may have a resonant circuit. The diode is not ideal. They have other parasitics, the output capacity have other parasitics, and in this area, you may have a very high frequency resonant circuit. You can not completely eliminate, but you can make it better in case that you use a synchronous buck, and instead of diode, you will use a MOSFET, which you will emulate a ideal diode, and in this way, you can reduce lot from the overshoot and you can reduce also the ringing. That's the one trick which you can uh, use if you want to have less EMI issues. But when you have a controller and you have an outside MOSFET, think about that this rectangle signal, it looks like a digital, it is like a digital signal and you cannot admit that this digital signal is going a very, very long path back to the um, controller because you will generate here a big loop antenna and with very fast rise time, it's a very high frequency uh, emission which you are generating here. It's a digital signal which need a matching of these uh, impedances of these tracks. The best thing is you have the same track lengths and you put a back path to the controller where the current will have to take this uh, away and not joining by accident somewhere and generating a big area and a loop antenna to radiate. The best thing what you can do if you have like a, a multi-layer PCB or two-layer PCB, you put the track to the MOSFET on the top and on the bottom you make another track and left and right hand from this uh, track you put ground planes and you put a lot of vias side by side. In this case you did generate something like a small coaxial cable connection. I talk with many people and um, many people say the EMI can be defined like a small formula. Um, this is not a correct, I would say not a mathematic formula, but um, you can define the EMI noise field. It is equal to the current multiplied by the loop area multiplied by the frequency. Because if you have more current, you may have automatically more magnetic field. If you have larger loop areas, you generate automatically larger antennas. So automatically you will have larger EMI field. As soon you talk about higher frequency, you may have higher harmonics, higher frequency noise. So this is something which you can do like, not like a mathematic formula, but it is, current by loop and area and frequency, that's the EMI noise field definition. And now we can go to this shortest path theory. And many times I was in mind that the shortest path is the best way for solving EMC issues until I get a problem and I realize it that my idea to make the shortest path was not that clever because my enclosed area was quite big for realizing this shortest path. So I decided to, to use instead of the shortest path, uh, 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 shortest uh, path area, uh, uh, sorry, tracks, I decided to have a mismatch on the impedance and I use this way. So I had a much smaller enclosed area, even was a little bit longer way, but the enclosed area was smaller and the EMC was excellent definitely only because of the PCB redesigning. Instead of including and including a big area, I choose a small area with longer tracks and the EMC did change a lot and I passed the EMC test. Keep in mind maybe sometime for your future design. Now, what you can do for a MAC converter, you have the input capacity and on front of input capacity for your third harmonic, you can calculate which inductor would be okay to filter that. But taking consideration that this inductor never can be something like one millihenry, because if you put a big millihenry inductance here, the input capacity will not be charged in time because the 
current flow through the inductor will slow down and if the capacity is not charged in time he will die hungry and he will be not able to feed the dc dc converter so inductance in filter mode and the capacity on input must be tuned to each other and normally you have a value here between i would say one micro henry to 10 micro henry very very rare you will need 22 micro henry or never ever milli henry i never use it because then you have a problem of the capacity charge this is for differential noise yeah so it's an example for uh, um, efficiency as well because you don't want that you destroy the efficiency of your uh, switching power supply using filters. If you design today something, I will assume that you need a minimum efficiency of 80% or sometimes even higher. But I will say 80% starting point is quite good. Then you have to take in consideration that through this inductant, if you make the output to input report multiplied by the current and the efficiency, you will have here, like in this example, 20 volt input, 5 volt output, 4 amp current, and 80% efficiency. You may have here calculation of the inductance 1.25 amp. 1.25 amp means for this inductance that he should be in the linear area, should be not saturated, should be not getting hot because of the DC resistance, because you want to achieve. Uh, a higher efficiency and you don't want to burn away the efficiency only on the input filter. I will switch now to the, because you need to know where is this point of the inductance and I will switch now to our um, website, which have this um, uh, Red Expert software online tool. I hope everybody can see it. And this is for free. You don't need to even to register. If you register, you have multiple uh, cursor possibility. And I will choose here something like a for example for, I don't know, let me check. I would say a buck converter. Let me check a buck converter because we talk about buck converter. And um, if you put this data like input voltage, I will leave on 12 volt output, 5 volt. I will put here 8 amp, not 2 amp, 500 kilohertz switching frequency, not gigahertz because it's too early to switch by 500 gigahertz today. Then the ripper current, and I say display details, automatically the software calculate for this device, for this power supply, it will be near the optimum inductance of 2.60 microhenry. We have a duty cycle of 35%. So 2.16, I will say, how about this one? Looks good. Nine milli handy, getting a little bit too hot. This is a total losses of the colossus, DC losses. So it generates too hot. I will go with another one. How about this one? 27 Kelvin, that looks better. I choose this one. So it means that this inductance in this um, device, which have uh, 12 volt to 5 volt, 8 amp, 500 kilohertz switching frequency. It will generate 553 milliwatt total losses, which is including AC losses. AC losses means not only core losses, we have also AC wire losses like proximity effect, the skin effect losses, the DC losses of core because of DC resistance. The total losses will generate a heat rise of 27.3 degree hotter like ambient. That's the definition of this Kelvin. So if I have a 20 degree ambient temperature, like you can see here, every data sheet for every manufacturer is measured laboratory condition at 20 degree. So if I put this current through this inductance, I will have a temperature rise with 500 kilohertz switching frequency, 27.3 Kelvin. So my temperature on the inductor will be 47.3. That's cool. I make this a little bit higher. Um, it's not a big issue at 8 amp. I can with, I can uh, use this inductance without problem. But maybe you have a inrush current when you switch on your motor or or device or booting the computer, whatever. You have for a few milliseconds an inrush current which could be something like 15 amp. That is too much. Okay, this inductance won't be the right because I need at least 2.16. Maybe your inrush current is something here like like here 13 amp 
Okay, you have a 13 m This inductance is still okay, still works. You you can test it. You will see. Wow, this works perfect. Every everybody happy. But this is on laboratory 20 degree. How about if I change the temperature? This is inductance versus current, like in a data sheet, and we did measure that on <clears throat> different temperature. And if I go down to 40 degrees Celsius, and I go again back to the 13 amp, 2.19, it's okay, it's not bad, it's still working. And you can see the saturation point getting more smoothly. So if it's minus 40 degree, I make anyway hot 27, so it will be never minus 40 degree on the inductance. These inductance have a value which is still working. But how about if I go in the hot ambient area because it can work up to 150 degrees Celsius. And if I have an ambient like 120 degrees Celsius, how about this now? And I go back to my 13 amp and I realize, uh-oh, at hot ambient temperature like 13 degree, uh, 120 degree and 13 amp inrush current, oops, my inductor would drop to 1.5. Now, I don't know if this IC will be able to withstand this high ripple, or I don't know if this is still operate correctly because I need 2.16 microhenry, and because of the ambient, my saturation point is shifted. And this happened to every other inductors as well. This is physics, simple physics. Nobody tell you, nobody show you. We are a little bit different from other manufacturers and we show you that because this happened to everybody in the same way. So be aware about that, that you are playing a little bit with some, I would say Russian roulette because on the laboratory condition it still works. If you have normal condition, it works for sure. But if you have a hot ambient temperature, you have to take care about the inrush because it could be not starting or not working or whatever, making a crazy state. This information you can find in the Red Expert. And I recommend to use the inductance for filtering always in this linear area. Never use the inductor in this area because then it will be not have the same value, not this 2.5 five micron which you need to filter, it will have this temperature and this current only something and then you cannot expect the filter will operate. All this information is in Red Expert. Please try it and use it. Now go back to my filter. I can improve this input filter. This inductance is responsible for the third harmonics, but if I put a second capacity, a value between 220 pico to one nano, ceramic low ESR, I can improve this filter with a chip bit ferrite additional. And now I have my beautiful, nice T filter or even a T PDK if you take that. <clears throat> okay, his filtering is not so good, but is more responsible for storage. But definitely with this additional capacity and ferrite bit, a value between 100 ohm to 300 ohm, I have a good choice to pass the EMC conductor emission for differential mode noise because this making an excellent decoupling of the noise and keep the noise inside. It won't be going out to the measurement machine. Now, this is a buck converter. If it's a boost converter, you can mirror completely this issue of the filter on the output because boost converter doesn't need big focus on input to filter. You need more to be filtered on output. All this filter, it works for differential mode noise. If it's a common mode noise, you need a common mode choke, of course. I prefer for power supply to use common mode choke with sector winding. Why sector winding? Because the sector or section or winded cores has a big leakage inductance. And I want to have this leakage inductance because the leakage inductance in addition with my input capacity it could be a, a X capacity and the output capacity, or I put additional or second output capacity here. I build my T filter with my leakage inductance. So I have something against the common mode because of common mode choke. And I have something against differential mode because I have the leakage inductance. And this is something for free and normally uh, 
on power supply doesn't have digital signals that I need a bifilar wounded one where they have no leakage or very exactly matched uh, inductance. So I like to have this leakage inductance for all and normally the leakage inductance is that not that big that the core is saturated for the noise. If your EMC noise is that big you have to saturate the core, maybe you choose a very, very tiny small core, which is 0603, or maybe your noise is that big if you have a big core that your voltage is more, much more like 20 volts per meter, and this is not any more DC-DC converter, this is a jammer or noise generator. Some PCB layout recommendation. What you can do on your PCB layout, it's very important that when you make your schematic and maybe a colleague make the layout, you have to talk about this connection because on the schematic, everything is galvanic correct, corrected, but the capacitor, if it has such long path to be grounded, that's a too high parasitics, which destroy the efficiency of the capacity. Capacity must be connected to ground after the soldering pad, you put the via directly to the ground. And it's much better and, and recommended to use two vias instead of one vias. One single via has 0.5 nanohenry inductance. If you put two inductance in parallel, you know it's half, put two resistance is half. Even some people put three on the filtering capacity. They, if they have space, they put three vias. I try once in one design uh, where I can use microvias and I put microvias directly to the, through the pad. It was excellent connection. Only the problem was my production um, engineer was not so um, friendly anymore to me because when you put past on the pad and you have microvias, it could happen that is something in the production doesn't go, let, I would say, not that well like expected. But in terms of EMI, I was happy. Definitely, I had to change that because it was not so good idea for the production. Some other issue from a customer, which uh, we try to solve the EMC issue on, on, on site, on the EMC lab, we solder um, common mode choke and some capacitor by air on wires, and he passed the EMC test, so he go home, make a redesign, redesign number one, looks like that. Noisy filter, unfiltered area, then capacitors, then common mode choke, and then he go back to EMC lab and he fail again and say, I don't know why, but the same common mode choke now it fails. As soon we saw this um, coupling here, we say, Hey, of course, because the noise which is carrying here, it will couple back, it's jumping again also on the filtered area, actually, it's over jumping this, uh, bypassing this filter. So, redesign number two. Input here, capacity, he did decouple a little bit better, but still have some coupling. He say, yeah, it is better, but I still have two peaks, which is not passing. So as soon we saw the second design, we said again, hey, no, no. We say one side in, one side out, but <clears throat> consider the common mode choke like a galvanic connected transformer. You have the dirty area and you have the clean area. You should have a separation. Sometimes I had a good um, experience, even when I had a outside long wire power supply that I put after the jack, my capacitors, my common mode choke, and under the jack and the common mode in the middle, I cut away even the ground under the, the jack and this area where I want to keep this noise outside of my machinery. And after the common mode choke, I declare my ground pin and it was perfect working and I was not uh, was not a problem for me immunity or emission at all. What is the big difference between shielded and unshielded inductance? Well, first of all, it's the bobbin. Both core have a bobbin core. You put a shielding ring for the unshielded version and make them shielded one. If you make a magnetic cut in the middle, you can see here the shade of the uh, core for, from this um, unshielded unshielded version, the highest magnetic field, of course, on the wire and is breaking out. If I put this shielding ring, the magnetic field take the easier path, the shortest path, because air is bad magnetic conductive, and he will turn back and he will not have such big radiation. But I have a gap on the top and bottom, this air gap, make that some of the magnetic field still leak out. Because of that, it's not 
very healthy if you track any um, sensitive tracks under the inductance directly because it could generate like a small transformer. Another nice example from our lab here, we had the PCB with a DC-DC converter with two megahertz switching frequency and one amp output of this power supply. It was a unshielded inductor soldered like a storage inductor. We make this measurement without taking in consideration the EMC level, just notice the peak. And then we check with a soldering iron, we take out, we desolder this inductance, which is unshielded and solder the same value shielded version. And the result was for the same DC-DC converter without modifying anything 90 dB better. So that's a, a, a proof that if you use a storage inductance, it's very healthy to use a shielded inductance. And if you go to the uh, anechoic chamber with a radiated emission, and you see this picture, I think you can very easily realize that this is, um, this is worth to, to, to use a shielded version of the storage inductance because the unshielded will radiate a lot. Another example, which I want to share with you from a customer who failed conductor emission. It was a very small motor uh, power supply. He used two unshielded inductors. He used a double side PCB. One side it was uh, routing, other one was ground and some violation as well, of course. And we saw this peak and we say, hey, change this inductance to shielded version. And because we have a lot of space here, float that with ground and make vias to have a good ground connection between top layer ground and bottom layer ground. He changed his PCB to that and go back to the EMC lab. And the EMC guy, the customer uh, tell us, the EMC guy, when he saw his uh, PCB say, hey, why you want to measure again? Because you don't have, you don't use any filter on, on your design. Why we should measure again? You think that your PCB now is green and before it was yellow, you will pass the EMC. The guy was not so willing to make measurements. So the customer say he was to beg him, hey, please, I'm here now. I make some modification. I pay for the measurement. Come on, take measurement. And when he start to measure, he start to be very quiet and, and start to, to check his antenna, to listen, even connect another device to see that his measurement but um, EMI receiver is still really working pretty good because that's the noise flow. You can see the bottom line. This is the noise flow of the EMI measurement. And the second track, second plot is the device which is made it. So from here, it becomes here only just with a small change to the shielded inductance and a new PCB here. Sometimes it's lucky punch. And I like when EMC guys get nervous because they don't know what is happening here. <laughs> That's so cool. Well, Red Expert, I put that uh, link in a PDF. If you click on the PDF, you can automatically go to this website from us where you can start to make your calculation for your inductance, the losses, or even capacitors, or even LEDs and, there are many, many different blocks, even the resonant tank for wireless power, you can calculate. If you do something with a TI chip, you can use this link for the webbench. I like at the TI uh, webbench, this uh, button, this, this switch, because you can optimize for highest efficiency or small footprint or low cost. They don't have a button make all efficient or make all low cost efficient and small print. You know, this is kind of paradoxical, which is not work really like that. Uh, I have this LT Spice link as well. Now it's on analog website, analog, uh, you know, they acquire uh, linear technology for a few years ago. And I just read today, they acquire now Maxim. And this is the LT Spice 17. And in for the LT Spice, we have models, even models for the ferrite bead with DC bias load with the pre-saturation of the Right beats, it's included. It's a very nice model and uh, correct measure. If you want to know more about uh, EMC or LD spice or ma magnetics or power supplies, um, we have these different books. Please contact our sales <coughs> colleagues from field. They are also engineers and we have everywhere and worldwide FIEs and they will be able to offer to your book or a copy of that. 
now I will say we can go to the questions. I will open the question chat and see if any other question already entered. it. So thank you at first, Lohan, for your interesting presentation. As you have mentioned, now we would like to turn our attention to your questions and we wait a little until some questions come in. You can do that with the chat function in the webinar control panel. So, Lorand, I see the first question. Um, what is the material of the SMD ferrites in typical? Well, 99% of our, our uh, ferrite beads are using um, nickel zinc material for um, uh, material for the ferrite core himself. So there are some silver layer, the inside layer is silver, but the body himself is 99% nickel zinc material. Okay, so thank you. As we have a look at the next questions, uh, just a hint from my side, you will receive the link to the presentation as well as to the recording of the webinar only in the next few weeks. So, next question. I saw, that, I saw um, another question here. Somebody asked if you don't take of EMC, don't take care of EMC, then what bad could happen while the operation of the buck converter? So if you don't take care of EMC, the operation of the buck converter, uh, actually the buck converter, just like a buck converter, operates almost quite good if you calculate everything correctly. Uh, if you don't take care about EMC and you don't give any importance of that, you will not pass the EMC test. It's very simple. A buck converter, I will say if you have only just maybe 50 milliamp current and very low voltage, not so high voltage where you don't generate electric field, no magnetic field, then maybe you will not need a filter. If you have a battery coin, like a small electric watch uh, coin battery, and you have a very small load and small currents and small areas, you don't have a problem of the EMC for the buck converter at all. But as soon you are talking about more several hundreds of milliamps and several hundreds of frequencies, you may have a problem, I'm definitely for sure, at least in the EMC chamber. Or sometimes I saw very often problem of internal EMC problem that is not the EMC low was the problem that they don't pass the EMC test. They make a, a such noise that the a power supply was resetting the microprocessor or some data lines cannot be um, read it in the correct form because the power supply was making such kind of noise that uh, the data line was such noisy that the noise level was higher like the data signal himself. Another question. I'm planning to design a lithium ion battery charger. Will the performance reduce or won't work expected if you don't consider EMC? Will the performance or won't work as expected if you if you don't consider EMC? Well, if you design the battery charger and your performance is okay and you don't consider EMC, it's again the same game. If you're happy with the performance and you don't have to test anything for EMC because it's something which is hidden in the metal box, which have no output wires, it's quite okay. It's a Faraday cage, no problem. Your input voltage is 12 volt AC to DC. Linear adapter using MCP73 for lithium polymer charger of microchip. A linear adapter. It means um, a linear transformer, I guess. Uh, yeah, in this case, you don't have switching power supply. You don't have a problem. If you have just a AC to DC linear 50 hertz transformer or whatever, and you put just rectified diodes, 
you can have maybe some noise of the rectifier ditch bridge but if you are not switching something and the charger is linear just by the resistors not a problem only when you have a switching you have a problem okay so, let's see some other question so yeah Lohan, there's the next question um after passing the test with emi filter for the range of frequencies um then when we connect the same to power up to dc to dc converter it was not powering up whether we need to put components of lower rdc or change caps to polymer to polymer could help so to, to polymer cup maybe to polymer. To polymer cup yeah okay after you pass the emc with the filter then you connect the same power supply to a converter to power up another converter and then it doesn't work so this is about understand i don't know maybe it's wrong so it may be you did test uh, uh, the power supply with the static load and if you put uh, the dynamic load it was not correct designed because a dynamic load is, is different and because when you change if you say components with lower dc or polymer caps um, it, it seemed that you have no enough storage your energy on the or your dynamic was not fast enough on the dc dc converter so definitely if you use components with low dc resistance you have high well efficiency for sure if you use polymer caps and you put that in parallel many polymer caps again the asr is reducing because you put in parallel and you can have a better storage of the energy and you distribute this energy on not only one capacity on other capacity you can try in this way but definitely look on the dynamic of your uh, dc dc converter that's that's what i'm assume that it's a problem okay so thank you lohan for your explanation if there are any questions left we will answer them via email after the live webinar so um now we are finished with our webinar and if you still have any other questions left after the webinar you can always uh, email us at isis minus webinar at we minus online.com so thank i still you have a message oh i still have a message please if you still have questions on anything like that or if it's emi not something which is working quite expected the most important thing is to never give up there's always a solution maybe you don't see it right now but there's always a solution and because of that try to call us we have worldwide local fie guys we have sales engineer they are experience and we can support you everywhere on the world with our local field application engineer and give you support and if you're doing something very uh, strange or something very um, i would say secret we have also we can sign an nda and we can try to help you because we are not just selling components we want to sell the technology we want that our products are helping you to your design and you can sell your design in many Many, many pieces that we can produce many components for you so that's the most important thing what you have to do just contact us we'll try to give you the best supports worldwide and if you want to keep in touch with us we have a twitter channel a youtube channel as well and on linkedin if you're get connected with me i will be very happy and if you have any question you can just ask and we will try to give our best so thank you for your participation and hope see you soon somewhere on some exhibition. Thank you, Lorand, and also from my side. Thank you for your attention. I wish you a good day. Goodbye.